Good evening. Glad you tuned in tonight. Hope you're ready to open the Bible together and look at some of the highlights from our readings in this past week. I feel like I need to explain that every week we come together on Wednesday night and we are reading chronologically through the Bible. We started January 1st. We'll end December 31st. And so here we're getting close to the middle of our of our reading. And every week we read a certain amount of scripture. And then on Wednesday night, uh, I talk about some of the stuff that appeared to appeal to me and that, you know, really jumped out at me. This last week we read from Proverbs 7 through chapter 24. We've also read 1 Kings 5 and 6, 2 Chronicles 2 and 3. And so tonight I want to spend, before we get uh, started, I want to just kind of give us a, a little preview of Proverbs because Proverbs is a very unusual book in the Bible. In fact, as you can see the notes on the screen, uh, Proverbs is a, from a Hebrew word that means comparison. Comparison. Comparing one thing and another. And as you've read this last week, you've probably seen uh, the evil and the righteous, the wicked and the good, and, and the comparison between them as you've read through uh, the Proverbs. I put a little note up here that Proverbs are short, pithy, unconnected, sometimes comparisons. They reveal accumulated wisdom, general insights of people who have observed life and God's word. It demonstrates uh, what it means to be wise and love God in practical ways. I, I would say, and I didn't put it on there, but Proverbs is real life. When you read the Proverbs, you say, man, I know somebody like that. Or you might say, I am somebody like that. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So if you look at how the book of Proverbs is laid out, the outline of it, I just wanted to share with you. The first nine verses are the Solomon's words of wisdom. And let me just say that the first nine chapters of Proverbs are pretty much paragraphs that are uh, subject related. And so there'll be four, five, six, eight, ten verses of scripture that are centered on kind of one subject together, the first nine chapters. When you come to chapter 10, Solomon's Proverbs from chapter 10 through chapter 24, and really it even goes through chapter 29, it changes. And then when you're looking at Proverbs there, there are more the little pithy staccato shots of truth. And it may take one verse, two verses, or three verses, but they're not long paragraph subjects. They're more like you'll go from talking about laziness to talking about uh, poverty to talking about um, uh, faithfulness within just three verses and they just change all the time the subject change then we would come to the last part of the book of proverbs and we'll get there um, this coming week we'll probably will finish up proverbs we have the words of augur which means gatherer in chapter 30 and then chapter 31 closes with the words of king lemuel lemuel means belonging to god some people think that King Lemuel was a name that Solomon's wife had for him, belonging to God. I don't know if that's true or not, but nevertheless, that's the outline of the book of Proverbs. So I want us to begin, and I just want to talk tonight about a few Proverbs that jumped out at me <laughs> that I want to just share with you, and then also some um, history of the building, uh, the construction of the temple by Solomon. All right, that's where we're going tonight. So I'm going to begin in Proverbs 7, where Solomon warns his son about adultery. Now this is big to uh, this is big when we come to looking at uh, at the subject of adultery because Solomon talks about it in chapter five, in chapter six, in chapter seven. And I'm not laughing at adultery, but I'm, what I'm laughing about is that Solomon, of all people, with 700 wives and 300 concubines, probably knew what he was talking about the dangers of adultery. And he, so he gives some warnings to his son about it. And I want you in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles in chapter seven, he begins by saying, my son, keep my words and treasure my commandments within you. So he's talking to his son and giving him these warnings. Keep my commandments and live in my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister to un and call understanding your intimate friend that they may keep you from an adulteress, from the foreigner who flatters with her lips. 
when he begins, he's talking about, you need these, I'm going to warn you about this, about the sin of adultery, about what it will do to you. And he said, listen to what I'm telling you. When he says, bind them on your fingers, write them on your heart, um, let this be as the apple of your eye. That means really listen to what I'm talking about. A little later in chapter 7, from verse 22 through verse 27, he writes more about it. In fact, the whole chapter 7 deals with it. And I'll ask you to read it. I know you've already read it, but I just want to go down to the conclusion in chapter 20, or verse 22. It talks about how the effect it has. Adultery has harsh consequences. And so we see it in verse 22. Suddenly he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter, as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool, until an arrow pisses through passes through his liver, pierces through his liver. As a bird hastens to a snare, so does he does not know that it will cost him his life. What he's talking about, all of these graphic images, and, and I'm even having trouble reading them, all of these graphic images, man, like an ox to the slaughter, uh, like fetters to the discipline of a fool, like arrow pierces your liver. That's what adultery is like. That's what it ends up being. That's, that are, those are the consequences. So verse 24, he says, Now therefore, my son, listen to me and pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many are the victims she has cast down, and numerous are all her slain. Her house is the way to Sheol, descending to the chambers of death. Man, what a way to look at the consequences of adultery. When I was reading this this last week, I, I couldn't help but think about the many people over years of ministry, pastoral ministry that I've counseled, many couples that have been through adultery, adulterous problem, the problem with adultery, ending in, ending in divorce many times. Sometimes it didn't. But what I thought about was, man, there are tremendous harsh consequences to adultery and all you have to do is ask somebody who's been through it it may have seemed like something to do on the front end there might have been it might have been exciting and whatever but man look at the cost it is extremely expensive all right let's go over to chapter eight we're right here at it in chapter eight he talks about the personification of wisdom and i put jesus up here because these words are a perfect picture of Jesus. I, I mean, he was the perfection of wisdom in everything he did. But I love the way the scriptures personify. It, it gives personhood to a thing, wisdom. In verse 1, chapter 8, he says, Does not wisdom call and understanding lift up her voice on top of the heights beside the way where the paths meet? She takes her stand. And man, here very beautifully, he's, he's telling us that wisdom, that wisdom is, is like someone standing beside the road and they're saying, listen to me, listen to what I have to say. This is very, very important. And it's kind of, it's a female voice, the personification of wisdom right here. He says she takes her stand there, listen to her. A little later in verses 10 through 21, I want you to see how beautiful this personification of wisdom is in verse 20 take my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choicest gold when he says take my instruction we're talking about it's not God really even though God is very wise but he's talking about the personification of wisdom take wisdom is saying take my instruction all right verse 11 for wisdom is better than jewels and all desirable things cannot compare with her Verse 12, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance in the evil way, and the perverted mouth I hate. Look at verse 14. Counsel is mine. This is what wisdom is saying. And sound wisdom. I am understanding. Power is mine. Verse 15, by me, by wisdom, kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me, Princes rule and nobles, all who judge rightly. I love those who love me. That's what wisdom is saying. I love those who love me, and those who diligently seek me will find me. 
Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even pure gold, and my yield better than choice of silver. I walk in the way of righteousness, wisdom, right? In the midst of the paths of justice to endow those who love me with wealth that I may fill their treasuries. Man, the personification of wisdom, so powerful, so beautiful. When you're wise, how it affects and you apply for wisdom, you strive for wisdom, you pray for wisdom. Remember James said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. God will give you wisdom, friend, if you ask him and if you seek wisdom. And much wisdom is found in the book, very book that we're reading today. I want us to notice a few things that he had to say also. This is all I call blessed truths about wives. So all of you husbands, listen up, because what the Bible says here about describing your wife is so valuable and so precious. In fact, in Proverbs 12, 4, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who shames him is like rottenness in his bones. An excellent wife is like a crown to her husband. Now, I know we live in times where people are very uh, gender concerned and, and we don't, I'm not talking about chauvinism, what I, am taking, what I am talking about is the husband and wife relationship. A wife crowns her husband with beauty. She makes him better, makes him uh, wiser, uh, makes him more effective. And the Bible says an excellent wife is a crown. And then and if you'll turn over a few more pages to Proverbs 18, 18th chapter of Proverbs and verse 22 it says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. If you're married, if you have a good wife, man, you have found a good thing. And not only that, you found the favor of God in that woman who is your partner for life. That woman who completes you, your help meet for you. And her you have found the favor of God. And there's one other verse that he talks about. In chapter 19, verse 14, just across the page, it said, House and wealth are inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Here we're talking about that she is a gift. You know, you receive houses and wealth from your parents. In inheritance, it's a gift to you. An inheritance gift to you. The scripture says, House and, wife, house and wealth are inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife you got from God. <laughs> and so when you think about your marriage husband and you look at that woman you're married to, that wife of yours, remember, treat her like a crown because she is, like a sign of God's favor because she is, and like a gift from God because that's exactly, exactly what she is. Now let's go to Another place in Proverbs, chapter 20, and then we're going to go to chapter 23 specifically. And I want to talk a few minutes. Now, I, I'm probably getting on thin ice right here. I, I may have been a while ago, but now I'm really getting on thin ice because I want to talk to you about the dangers of drinking alcohol. If you were to say to me, Brother Larry, you've been in ministry for years and you've pastored for years, and what has changed the most in the last 25 years in churches? There have been a lot of changes that have taken place. And I'm not talking about contemporary music. I'm not talking about a lot of other stuff. I'm talking about, if you said, what has changed the most? I would say the church's attitude toward drinking alcohol. Um, this has changed the most. Because 25 years ago, uh, Christian people, church members, uh, for them to drink socially was just kind of not acceptable and they just didn't do it. And now it's kind of, um, it's just kind of common for Christian people, church members, to drink alcohol. So I want to read what the Bible says as far as warnings. And I want, if you drink uh, socially or whatever, I'm not trying to put you down, but I do want you to know what the Bible says about the dangers of alcohol to drink. I think chapter 20, verse 1, I want to read this, then we're going to jump over to chapter 23. Proverbs 20, verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, 
and whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. I think the, the King James says, whoever is deceived by it is not wise. So what's the idea? Wine is a mocker. A strong drink is raging. And, and if you're deceived by it, then that's a lack of wisdom on your part. So right in the very beginning, he said, listen, you need to be wise about that. There needs to be some wisdom. And then a little bit further over in chapter 23, I want, to look, I want you to look with me at some verses beginning in verse 29. Chapter 23 of Proverbs, verse 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long over wine, those who go to taste mixed wine. In these verses, he is giving us some uh, reasons to understand and to be very careful about alcohol. Um, because alcohol brings woe. Look at those words in verses 29 and 30. Woe, sorrow, contentions, fights, complaints, wounds. All of these are connected with drinking alcohol. I mean, every one of them. And then he goes on and talks about the enticements. Why do people use it? In verse 31, he said, Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly and... Uh, these are the very things that are used to advertise alcohol. I mean, look at the sparkly. It's so smooth, it goes down smoothly. That is the enticement. So I want us to come to the very last few verses because in the end, he talks about the effects of alcohol. And here's where the rubber meets the road. I mean, this is where it makes such a difference. In verse 31, uh, he said, in verse 32, I mean, at the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Man, that's a good description of alcohol. When it, after everything's said and done, man, it'll bite you. It stings you. Verse 33 says this, your eyes will see strange things and your mind will utter perverse things. People under the influence of alcohol say things. They, their mouth utters strange things, perverse things. People say things they don't mean. They say things that they would never say because it removes the natural inhibition. Alcohol will change your behavior. The inhibition that keep you from saying the wrong thing and doing the wrong thing when you're under the influence of alcohol, those inhibitions are removed. And that's the reason there are contentions and sorrow and complaints and woe connected with it. And, and I, I just, I just, to me, it's just as clear as a bell. Your mind will utter perverse things. I used to work with a man who, when I was going to seminary, I worked second shift at a box plant for four years. While I finished um, going to school in the daytime, I'd work second shift at night. I worked with a fella, very intelligent. He was going to USC. He was a man, a brilliant young guy. But he would go get, uh, he and his dad would go get drunk every Friday. And um, not being a drinker, I couldn't understand. You know, here he is. I think he was sober all week, as far as I could tell. But he would tell me about what they were doing. And one time I said, why do you want to do that? Why, why do you want to do that? And here's what he said. He was a young guy, and he was kind of quiet. And he said, you know, he said, when I drink, it makes me good with girls. That's what he said. You know what it would do? It would remove some of those inhibitions that he had naturally felt. And so he was glib and social and everything when he was under the influence. That wasn't really him. That was the alcohol speaking through him. And so that's why uh, it says that it, it, it removes those natural inhibitions. And then verse 34, it can make you drunk. You will be like one who lies down in the middle of the sea or like one who lies down on the top of a mast. Imagine being on the mast of a ship that is swaying like this. <laughs> now, this is not funny. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to, to laugh. But imagine being on the top of the mast of a ship that is swaying, and here he says, that's what it's like under the influence. And then the last thing he said in verse 35, he said, they struck me, but I did not become ill. They beat me, but I do not know it. When shall I awake? I will seek another drink. I'll seek another drink. It is numbing and 
It is addicting. All of these things talk about the dangers of alcohol, of drinking alcohol. And I just think that we need to be aware. And I'm sure you, if you read it this last week and you're reading Proverbs 23, you said, man, is that clear? Does that describe some of the dangers, some of the, um, the outcomes, some of the repercussions of being under the influence of alcohol? Sad, sad thing that happens in the lives of way too many people across our land. Sometimes even Christian people. Sometimes non-Christian people. Influence, that's why they call it driving under the influence. DWI, driving with intoxication. DUI, this is what it is. And um, I came across something that really struck me, and I want to share it with you tonight. Uh, this was written by Evangeline Booth, who was the daughter of William Booth, who was the founder of the Salvation Army in England in the 1800s. And of course, the Salvation Army was originally begun to deal with uh, presenting the gospel to people that were down and out, people that needed to hear the message. And some of them were alcoholics and drunkards and, and all kinds of other uh, people that were having issues that they could not get ahead a in life. And, and so the, it was begun to try to help them and to present the gospel to them. But, but listen to what she said. She said, drink, when she's talking about beverage, alcoholic beverage, she said, drink has drained more blood, hung more crepe, sold more houses, plunged more people into bankruptcy, armed more villains, slain more children, snapped more wedding rings, defiled more innocents, blinded more eyes, twisted more limbs, dethroned more reason, wrecked more manhood, dishonored more womanhood, broken more hearts, blasted more lives, driven more to suicide, and dug more graves than any other poison scourge that ever swept his death-dealing waves across the world. What Evangeline Booth said was right. When you look at the effects, the compounded effects of alcohol in our society, people killed by drunk drivers, people fights, um, murders, arguments, divorces, thefts. I, man, you could just go on and on and on and on. And I, and I know if you say, preacher, you're on your soapbox. I guess I am on my soapbox. And what I'm telling you is this, is if you leave it alone, you'll never have to worry about that. Now, you may have other stuff that you'll have to deal with and think about and worry about and fret with and overcome. But if you'll leave it alone, then it won't bother you, okay? Now, I want us to go to 1 Kings chapter 5 and notice a few things about when Solomon built the temple. As he is getting ready to build, he's gathering his material and his alliances that he makes, he talks about it in 1 Kings 5, verse 1. In your Bible, notice with me. Now, Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father, for Hiram had always been a friend of David. Then Solomon sent word to Hiram saying, you know that David my father was unable to build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of, of the wars which surrounded him until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. Behold, I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spoke to David my father, saying, Your son, whom I have set, whom I will set over your throne in your place, he will build the house for my name. So he sums up verse 6. Now, therefore, command that they cut for me cedars from Lebanon, and my servants will be with your servants, and I will give you wages for your servants according to all that you say. For you know that there is no one among us who knows how to cut timber like the Sidonians. It's interesting right here that Solomon makes an alliance as his father David had done with Hiram, the king of Tyre. And um, during this time, Tyre is, was in Lebanon, the country of Lebanon. And Solomon needed cedar because cedar wood was the most beautiful workable wood. They used it for building ships. They built it for used it for building palaces. In fact, I did a little bit of research on the, 
on the uh, cedars of Lebanon and found out that about 1,700 years ago, around 300 A.D., they almost depleted the whole supply of cedar from Lebanon because of its use, its overuse. All right? Then if you drop down with me in the next, um, whoop, I was reading that without you looking. In chapter 5, verses 12 through 18, he talks about the material for the temple. Here he's talking about the cedars that were in Lebanon. And I, and I just want you to see with me, and I was struck by this when I read it, Verse 12, the Lord gave wisdom to Solomon just as he promised him. And there was peace between Hiram and Solomon and the two of them made a covenant. Now King Solomon levied forced laborers from all Israel and forced laborers numbered 30,000 men. He sent them to Lebanon 10,000 a month in relays. They were in Lebanon a month and two months at home. And Adoniram was over the forced laborers. Now Solomon had 70,000 transporters and 80,000 hewers of stone in the mountains. Besides Solomon's 3,300 chief deputies who were over the project and who ruled over the people who were doing the work, then the king commanded and they quarried great stones, costly stones, to lay the foundation of the house with cut stones. So Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders and the uh, Jebelites cut them and prepared the timbers and the stones to build the house. There are two, two main things that they really put emphasis in these verses. One of them was the timbers, the cedars of Lebanon, and how they cut them and brought them to Jerusalem for building uh, the beautiful temple, and also the beautiful stones, the stonework that was done. And so I want you to just understand, if you're not familiar with the geography of that region, Lebanon is right above the nation of Israel today, and it was in those days. And so when they would cut the timber, they would bring them from Lebanon, float them down in the Sea of the Mediterranean Sea till around right over here by Tel Aviv, and then they would transport them across land to the city of Jerusalem. The country of Lebanon itself, when I was able to dig up some information, I found that right up in this area in the Bekaa Valley, is where, and right over there, I mean the Lebanon mountain, is where they would get the timber, where they grew the cedars of Lebanon. And I thought that was very, very interesting. The second thing that they focused on were the stones that were cut. And I wanted you to know that today, here we are almost 3,000 years from the time Solomon built the temple, that there, the stones of the foundation of Solomon's temple are still, you can still see them in the city of Jerusalem. Amazing. Now, I'm using a, a map of the, of the Temple Mount, the Dome of the Rock. Here's the Temple Mount. Right here is the Western Wall we call the Wailing Wall. And this points out the tunnel that runs along from the Wailing Wall northward on this Western Wall of the foundation of the Temple Mount. There's a tunnel that was dug that goes all along the edge. And here's the entrance, a picture of the entrance to the Western Wall Tunnel. And when we were there a couple of years ago, we were able to, um, to go down and see in that tunnel, this is a picture, in fact, there's my wife Pat is reaching up and touching the stone. All of the stone, some of it was from Herod's temple, the lower part was from Solomon's temple. Imagine stone cutting, laying such a foundation for the temple, for the house of God, that it is still there. And you just walk for a long, long ways in that tunnel where you can see all up on your right, the foundation from Solomon's temple to Herod's temple. In fact, there's a place right over about halfway through that the scholars and rabbis believe that beyond this is a part of the wall that was Solomon's, Solomon's temple, that this is where the Holy of Holies was. And there's a special little inlet there where people go, just like these ladies, are there praying at this very holy place where on the other side of that wall, at one time, 3,000 years ago, was where the Holy of Holies was. And so when you think about the stones that were, that were uh, brought to use for the foundation that are still there, and all of that timber from, the, uh, from Lebanon, man, it must have been a tremendous ordeal. 
And so in chapter 6, he's constructing the temple right here. Chapter 6, verse 1, I want to read a few verses here. Verse 1 says, Now it came about in the 480th year after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Zeb, Zeb which is the second month, that, it, that he began to build the house of the Lord. And we know that if you read the details, it took seven years. Drop down to verse 7. The house, with, while it was being built, was built of stone prepared at the quarry, and there was neither hammer nor axe nor any iron tool heard in the house while it was being built. It was, it was built in such a way that the stones were cut to fit, and he said there was no hammering going on when the Lord's house was being built. And then if you turn over to verse 19, it says this, Then he prepared an inner sanctuary, talking about Solomon's preparation for the temple, within the house in order to place there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. The inner sanctuary, and he's talking about the Holy of Holies, was 20 cubits in length, 20 cubits in width, and 20 cubits in height. That's about 30 feet. 30 feet wide, 30 feet long, 30 feet high was the Holy of Holies. And look at this. He overlaid it with pure gold. He also overlaid the altar with cedar. So Solomon overlaid the inside of the house with pure gold, and he drew chains of gold across the front of the inner sanctuary, and he overlaid it with gold. And he overlaid the whole house with gold until all the house was finished. Also the whole altar, which was by the inner sanctuary, he overlaid with gold. Man, so beautiful that must have been. In fact, I have a picture that is an artist's rendition of what the temple must have looked like when it was completed, Solomon's temple. And you can see the court, you can see the temple itself with the height and also inside uh, the holy place in the Holy of Holies. Uh, just must have been a magnificent structure built on that stone solid foundation that's still there, built with the cedars of Lebanon, and then many, many, much of that covered with pure gold. Now I want to wrap up our lesson tonight by talking about some reflections, three reflections from our Bible readings this week. The first one is this. I'd like for you to consider reading a chapter of Proverbs each day of the month. <laughs> now, I know you're reading through the Bible, and I am too. We, you know, we, every week we have our reading schedule. We're going through Scripture, and we're almost, like I said, almost halfway through there, and that's wonderful. But someone suggested several years ago, when we talk about the book of Proverbs, there are 31 chapters, and most months have 31 days. Some have 28, one has 28, some have 30. But for the most part, 31 days. And I have a friend of mine who every day, Whatever day of the month, today is the ninth. Uh, you'll see this, this, I'm recording this early, so tomorrow will be the 10th. So the 10th of the month, he reads Proverbs chapter 10. And over a period of month, every month he reads it again. Now, you say, why? Well, because the book of Proverbs is such wisdom, wisdom personified. It is, it, it corrects us, it hits us where we live, you know, uh, and it speaks to our hearts, right? Uh, where God can touch us and change us. So I would suggest you consider doing that. Maybe do it after we get through with our Bible readings for this year. Secondly, I want us to look at this. You say, so what about this? Well, we can try to read it today. Read Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 periodically as a reminder of the cost of adultery. It is expensive. And I'm not talking about alimony or child support. Adultery is expensive. It pays. There are people that because of adultery and divorce that has come and later remarried, that they carry that baggage with them as long as they live. Man, you cannot imagine that. If you read Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 periodically, those three chapters will really open your eyes to the danger of adultery. And then one other thing, and I, I hate to, this is all corrective, but nevertheless, think about the addiction and destruction of alcohol. Teetotaling is always a safe and wise option. Now, I know you're going to say, well, preacher, that's just you. You're, you know, I've been a teetotaler my whole life, um, and I haven't missed it. Man, I have a better time than most people. <laughs> I think most people who drink or don't drink, I just enjoy life. And, and you don't have to 
you don't have to drink alcohol to have a good, have fun, to enjoy things, you know. And I need, I think we need to think about the addiction that's connected with that, the destruction. What about our kids as they're growing up? If we allow it in our home, in ourselves, what are they going to do? Uh, they may be, uh, have a tendency toward alcoholism. We don't know that. You don't know that. And man, I would hate to even just set the example that says that. And so I want you to think about it. Think about the addiction and destruction of alcohol. And consider being a teetotaler. Uh, these days, people who have gotten free from alcoholism, they will always say, I am an alcoholic, but I've been dry for 10 years. And you know why they say that? They say that because they know that all it takes is to slip, to go back, and everything would crumble down. And so they don't think they're better than anybody. They just say, I'm going to stay away from it because it rules me when I, when I, when I drink it. So... Hope you have a great week. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, we thank you for the few minutes you've given for us to be together. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the power and the simplicity uh, and the reality of your word and what you say. God, it just touches us right where we live. Lord, we can see the truth of this. And Lord, I just pray uh, that you will help us to apply the biblical concepts and the precepts that we get from your word that you would give us the strength to put it to practice in our lives for your glory we're not talking about making us look good we're talking about living a life that honors you for your glory and i pray that you would help us to do that give us a great week as we open your word and we go from day to day and we ask this all in jesus name amen have a good week